The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. <laughs> And I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Monday, September 5th, 2022. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five time award winning majority report. We are broadcasting live to tape tips from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. <laughs> On the program today, folks. It is our famous Labor Day uh, compilation because we are taking Labor Day off. Uh, on the program today, a speech by Eugene Debs as read by Senator Bernie Sanders, followed by a speech by Franklin Delano Roosevelt entitled Four Freedoms, about the Four Freedoms. A, I, I, just a a very good way to frame uh, those policies that FDR promoted. And also, you can see evidence of that, frankly, in the way that um, the abortion amendment to the Constitution in Kansas um, uh, was, was sold in Kansas. Uh, also, we have a speech from United Mine Workers President John L. Lewis, a song from an Alabama mine worker, Uncle George Jones, and a speech from Mario Savio, which, if you are a um, a fan of uh, the um, Battlestar Galactica remake, you will know uh, that speech was borrowed by uh, one of the episodes they had where they were unionizing um, wow. on, uh, on, a, on a foreign planet. Uh, like, a, I don't know, some other planet. Uh, Emma, join me here. Um, because, hi. Uh, hi. So we are uh, off today. I don't know what you're doing. I'm, 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 I might be actually in the office, cleaning the office. Oh. But, yeah. Uh, but nevertheless, um, something really big is happening tomorrow, isn't it? Apparently so. Well, I'm in control of it, so I don't know why I'm using a passive voice there, but... I am uh, going to be streaming the first episode of my new sports show, ESVN, the Emma Sports Vigilant Network. ESVN. <laughs> there it is. Uh, so what if anyone was uh, 4 p.m., uh, it's going to be on the Majority Report channel, but um, I am also have a YouTube channel up, going to clip some things, put things up there, uh, ESVN show, you can look it up there. Um, yeah, we're just going to be talking about the NFL season that's approaching, make some picks for division winners, wild card, uh, uh, playoff winners. That's not really the right way to say it, but who's going to be making the playoffs? Who's going to be winning the Super Bowl? Who's going to be MVP? We're going to be the worst five teams in the league might be in the running for CJ Stroud, uh, other quarterbacks coming out in the draft in 2023. So that's where we're going to be starting. And then the show will gradually as the NBA NHL seasons roll around, be incorporating some of those topics as well. I'm very excited. And, and you're going to uh, be taking calls. Yes. Um, that is the plan. And so people know it'll be me and Bradley. Bradley's going to be leading the charge on here. So if you needed more Bradley Alsop in your life, tune into ESVN. And who doesn't, who doesn't honestly, all right, so uh, just getting back to um, uh, the labor situation, it is Labor Day, and labor is in as good a shape as it's been uh, in uh, maybe decades uh, in this country. Um, 2022, so far, in the first half of the year, unions won 641 elections. That's the most in nearly 20 years. That's according to data from a Bloomberg Law. This is uh, coming from a... Um, a Vox piece, which an analyzes National Labor Relations Board. And again, let's be clear. the Having Joe Biden, for all of the things that we have criticized for him for, whatnot, 
having a Democratic president who um, is being influenced by people like Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders, frankly, particularly when it comes to labor, choosing a National Labor Relations Board and particularly the uh, the the council, uh, the uh, general counsel of the board who do stuff that's small, doesn't make uh, headlines, but like changing a rule where you're allowed to organize on the physical property of the company. Um we had folks from the uh, independent Amazon union on the program who said that is what made it possible for them to uh, unionize that Amazon in Staten Island. And that Amazon uh, unionization is what spurred on the Starbucks unionization. And Starbucks is up to now 230 stores that are unionized this year. Amazing. And when you say that, uh, when you speaking of Amazon too, on Friday, uh, when, when we're filming this, the NLRB basically just rejected Amazon's challenge to yep. uh, the JFK 8 union uh, success story. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that Biden has constructed, in terms of leadership at the National Labor Relations Board, the most uh, pro-labor union, uh, most pro-labor board since, I don't know, many decades. Yeah, I think so. And um, uh there have been 80% more National Labor Relations Board election wins in 2022 than there were in 2021, and those wins represent more than twice as many workers, 43,000 as last year. Unions have already won 77% of their elections this year, matching the highest rate in the Bloomberg data going back to 2000. Uh, petitions for future elections were up nearly 60% in the first nine months of the fiscal year. We just uh, heard uh, Apple uh, store in Oklahoma um, uh, is... Uh, just, uh, I think, um, got a petition for an election. So there's, and, and now this is just the beginning. There needs to be a lot more. This needs to continue. And we'll see if the moves by the Fed to essentially uh, hurt employment numbers will impact this. But for right now, things are looking in, at least in terms of the trajectory, uh, looking in the right direction for unions. So with that in mind, Enjoy this speech by Eugene, uh, by Bernie Sanders, uh, written by Eugene Debs. Uh, uh, FDR is for Freedoms, speech from United Mine Workers, President John L. Lewis, song from an Alabama mine worker, Uncle George Jones, and then lastly, a speech from Mario Savio. And we will be back live tomorrow, Tuesday. And also, reminder, Emma at 4 p.m., same channel. Uh, you can watch it here. Uh, will be live with her uh, sports talk show. All right, folks, have a good day off. In September of 1915, Gene Debs gave his views of the war, then raging in Europe. I am not a capitalist soldier. I am a proletarian revolutionist. I am opposed to every war but one. I am for that war with heart and soul, and that is the worldwide war of the social revolution. In that war, I am prepared to fight in any way the ruling class may make necessary, even to the barricades. That is where I stand and where I believe the Socialist Party stands or ought to stand on the question of war. In June of 1918, with American troops now fighting in Europe, Debs spoke to a socialist gathering in Canton, Ohio. In this, his most famous speech, he outlined the socialist opposition to the war and gave his unqualified support to the Russian Revolution, which had just taken place under the leadership of Lenin and Trotsky. This was also the speech for which he was sentenced to jail. In the Middle Ages, the feudal lords and barons, the economic predecessors of the capitalists of our day, declared all wars, and their miserable serfs fought all the battles. The poor, ignorant serfs had been taught to revere their masters, to believe that when their masters declared war upon one another, it was their patriotic duty to fall upon each other and to cut one another's throats for the profit and glory of the lords and barons who held them in contempt. And that is war in a nutshell. It hasn't changed. The master class has always declared the wars. The subject class has always fought the battles. The master class has had all to gain and nothing to lose, while the subject class has had nothing to gain and all to lose, especially their lives.
The ruling class has always taught and trained you to believe it to be your patriotic duty to go to war and to have yourself slaughtered at their command. But in all the history of the world, you, the people, have never had a voice in declaring war. And strange as it certainly appears, no war by any nation in any age has ever been declared by the people. And here let me emphasize the fact, and it cannot be repeated too often, that the working class who fight all the battles, the working class who make the supreme sacrifices, the working class who freely shed their blood and furnish the corpses, have never yet had a voice in either declaring war or making peace. It is the ruling class that invariably does both. They alone declare war, and they alone make peace. Yours not to reason why, yours but to do or die. This is their model, and we object on the part of the awakening workers of this nation. Two weeks after he gave his Canton, Ohio speech, Gene Debs was arrested and charged with violating the Espionage Act. Two months later, he was tried, found guilty of the charges, and sentenced to 10 years in prison. From FDR, Franklin uh, Delano Roosevelt's uh, Four Freedoms speech, which was actually the uh, 1941 State of the Union address. So this is um, about 10, 11, almost 12 months uh, before uh, we uh, we entered uh, World War II. And uh, this is the speech where he laid out uh, two, I guess, freedoms uh, that... Uh, go beyond the, the Constitution and uh, basically said that, uh, you know, we uh, human beings have a right to economic security. And uh, this is a fairly new theme at that point, And uh, look where it got us, in a good place, until, of course, um, uh, the right wing and uh, the money in this country decided uh, they had enough of that. But here is a clip from that speech now. As men do not live by bread alone, they do not fight by armament alone. Those who man our defenses and those behind them who build our defenses must have the stamina and the courage which come from unshakable belief in the manner of life which they are defending. The mighty action that we are calling for cannot be based on a disregard of all the things worth fighting for. The nation takes great satisfaction and much strength from the things which have been done to make its people conscious of their individual stake in the preservation of democratic life in America. Those things have toughened the fiber of our people, have renewed their faith, and strengthen their devotion to the institutions we make ready to protect. Certainly this is no time for any of us to stop thinking about the social and economic problems which are the root cause of the social revolution which is today a supreme factor in the world. For there is nothing mysterious about the foundations of a healthy and strong democracy, the basic things expected by our people of their political and economic systems are simple. They are equality of opportunity for you and for others, jobs for those who can work, security for those who need it, the ending of special privilege for the few, the preservation of civil liberties for all, the enjoyment, the enjoyment of the fruits of scientific progress in a wider and constantly rising standard of living. 
These are the simple, the basic things that must never be lost sight of in the turmoil and unbelievable complexity of our modern world. The inner and abiding strength of our economic and political system is dependent upon the degree to which they fulfill these expectations. Many subjects connected with our social economy call for immediate improvement. As example, we should bring more citizens under the coverage of old age pensions and unemployment insurance. We should widen the opportunities for adequate medical care. We should plan a better system by which persons deserving or needing gainful employment may obtain it. I have called for personal sacrifice, and I am assured of the willingness of almost all Americans to respond to that cause. A part of the sacrifice means the payment of more money in taxes. In my budget message, I will recommend that a greater portion of this great defense program be paid for from taxation than we are paying for today. No person should try or be allowed to get rich out of the program. And the principle of tax payments, in accordance with ability to pay, should be constantly before our eyes to guide our legislation. If the Congress maintains these principles, the voters, putting patriotism ahead of pocketbooks, will give you their applause. In the future days, which we seek to make secure, we look forward to a world founded upon four essential human freedoms. The first is freedom of speech and expression everywhere in the world. The second is freedom of every person to worship God in his own way everywhere in the world. The third is freedom from want, which translated into world terms means economic understandings which will secure to every nation a healthy, peacetime life for its inhabitants everywhere in the world. The fourth is freedom from fear, which translated into world terms means a worldwide reduction of armament to such a point and in such a thorough fashion that no nation will be in a position to commit an act of physical aggression against any neighbor anywhere in the world. <laughs> that is no vision of a distant millennium. It is a definite basis for a kind of world attainable in our own time and generation. That kind of world is the very antithesis of the so-called new order of tyranny which the dictators seek to create with the crash of a bomb. To that new order, we oppose the greater conception, the moral order. A good society is able to face Schemes of world domination and foreign revolutions alike without fear. 
since the beginning of our American history, we have been engaged in change in a perpetual, peaceful revolution, a revolution which goes on steadily, quietly, adjusting itself to changing conditions without the concentration camp or the quicklime in the ditch. The world order which we seek is the cooperation of free countries working together in a friendly, civilized society. This nation has placed its destiny in the hands and head and heart of its millions of free men and women, and its faith in freedom under the guidance of God. Freedom means the supremacy of human rights everywhere. Our support goes to those who struggle to gain those rights and keep them. Our strength is our unity of purpose to that high concept there can be no end save victory. Okay, now this is a uh, speech from John L. Lewis. He was the um, probably one of the most famous uh, labor union leaders uh, in this country ever. He was the um, head of the United Mine Workers for, gosh, I don't know, 20, 20 some odd years, maybe more. Uh, and uh, some of his best speeches, I think, come from the 30s, but I couldn't find one. Um, uh, I found this one from, uh, I think it was uh, late 1952. Uh, he is in uh, Charleston, West Virginia, and he's endorsing Adlai Stevenson in his run for president. And uh, but it's a, it's still a great union speech, and you really get a sense of uh, just how um, powerful a speaker this guy was. Uh, so here it is. When our most unarmed coal miners marching together as a symbol of their right to express themselves as free men. We're opposed on the crest of Blair Mountain by 600 private soldiers maintained by the Logan County Coal Operators Association. <laughs> Paid for by a royalty of 10 cents a ton on all coal mined in, this, in that county and paid into a pool from which was drawn the money to buy rifles and ammunition and equipment for 600 mine guards and to pay their salary and their keep. The same operators who revel, level those royalties knew cried aloud to high heaven when the mine workers' union suggested the levying of a royalty of 10 cents a ton to care for the mine workers whose health was destroyed or whose lives were abused in the coal mines. They said then that the right to levy royalties was merely the right of kings and coal operators. <laughs> And we said it was also the right of coal miners, and we demonstrated that fact. <laughs> yes, and may I say to the miners in northern West Virginia who may be listening tonight, that I remember when 25,000 men in those northern coal fields were evicted from their homes by the Associated Coal Operators, chief of which was the Consolidation Coal Company. And through long winters and through starvation and disease, they fought the fight for the right to belong to their union and to mine coal for more than the 20 cents a ton that the operators were paying at that time. 20 cents a ton. 
for mining a ton of coal underground. When there isn't a man within the sound of my voice or in the state of West Virginia, we could pick up a ton of coal and move it three inches for 20 cents. They lived in the barracks. They froze in the winter. They did without medicine and medical attention and teachers for their children. They buried their dead, unkempt as they might be, in order that mountaineers might be free, and in order that West Virginia and West Virginians might have a right to govern themselves and to select honorable men for public office. The same is true in the New River and the Winding Gulf. The same is true in all of the Pocahontas and the Tug River. The same is true in the Panhandle of West Virginia. The same is true on both banks of the Monongahela River. And today, more than 100,000 coal miners in this state, in its several districts, are working when they work under the rules of collective bargaining and under wages and working conditions that American citizens have a right to enjoy and which no other citizen could ask them not to pay. We intend to keep it that way. And I come to West Virginia tonight to say a word of advice in coal miners. A word of advice to coal miners. And not alone, coal miners, but to every citizen of West Virginia who believes in proper treatment of his fellow citizens and who likewise wants to improve his profession or business by participation in the increased prosperity which comes to a community or a state when the people who work are properly compensated. What has become of the increased earnings of the West Virginia mine workers since they were organized at the end of the Republican Depression of 1929? What has become of that money? Like everyone else, the mine worker was only able to retain for himself and any savings account but a small proportion of his earnings. Because he spent it for the necessities of life. He spent it for shoes for the children, for increased education, for improved facilities in the home, for a broader outlook. And he spent it in his home community, and the businessmen of that community, and the professional men of that community, and the churches of that community. And every institution in the state of West Virginia has benefited by its participation in the increased wage standards brought to this state by the United Mine Workers of America. It isn't very long. It isn't very long. As a matter of fact, it's only 18 years since the wages in Logan County were a dollar and a half and a dollar seventy-five cents a day for a supposed ten-hour day, but which in reality was a clean-up day and more often fourteen and fifteen hours. How much better are the businessmen, the farmers, and the professional men of Logan County today 
because the mine workers have money to become their customers, to buy their goods, to buy their motor cars, to receive their professional services, whether they're medical men or whether they're attorneys or other practitioners in the profession. All of the citizens of West Virginia have shared in this improvement. And what is true in Logan County has been true in every other mining sector of the state. And what is true in the mining sections of West Virginia is likewise true in the chemical industry, in the lumbering industry, in the railroad industry, in the limestone industry. And it's true of all of West Virginia. Do you want to change it? Then don't elect a hypocrite and a fool to be governor of West Virginia. just come here from a great international convention of the United Mine Workers of America with delegates from its several local unions, which was in session in the Queen City of Cincinnati for about eight days. And at that convention, I am witnessed one of the most dramatic and marvelous exhibitions of enthusiasm and determination that has been my lot to see. 2,805 elected delegates from the coal mines of this country, from the Cascade Mountains of Washington to the warrior field of Alabama, from the anthracite jurisdiction of Pennsylvania to the far-flung mines of New Mexico. And those 2,805 men, after due consideration, adopted a resolution by a rising, standing, unanimous vote to urge upon the mine workers of this country and all other members of organized labor that they refuse to take a professional soldier for president of the United States, but that they take a great human, humanitarian and public-spirited citizen in the person of Adlai E. Stevenson as a recommendation. <laughs> Surely those men must have represented the sentiment of the men at home. Surely that demonstrates that men in who, who work in coal mines are thinking men. Surely it makes one believe that they understand the problems of life in America and the burden and the responsibilities of rearing and educating a family to their proper place in the community of citizenship. 2,805 delegates responsible to nobody but the men in their home community who elected them by unanimous vote instructed the officers of your organization to do everything possible to urge our membership and all other citizens similarly situated to cast aside and push away the alluring siren voice of those candidates who represent the concentrated wealth and power of the American industry and financial world and who walk to elect their man in the White House so that he may make the rules for you and I and those similarly situated. So I am here for that purpose, and I come here also to say that in this great state, I would like to have you, if the miners of this state will take my counsel and advice, because they may believe to some degree in the responsibility of what I say. 
I would like to have the mine workers of this great state and other states not only vote for Honorable Adlai E. Stevenson for President of the United States, but vote for Bill Marlin as Governor of West Virginia and Harvey Kilgore as Senator. Okay, so next up is a four-minute song by a guy named Uncle George Jones. He was a United Mine worker, uh, and um, he was a mine worker back in the late 1800s. He went blind in the um, around, uh, I guess, uh, the second uh, decade of the 20th century, around like uh, 1915 or something. He went blind. Uh, he was working in the Alabama mines, and he was singing essentially about the... Um, uh, revival of the United Mine Workers, and um, as well as singing the praises of unions, he mentions uh, John L. Lewis in this, and obviously um, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. So uh, check it out, enjoy it. Interesting song, and we still got more. In 1933, when Mr. Roosevelt took his seat, said to President John L. Lewis, "In union we must be." Come, let us work together as God to lead the plan. By this time, another year, we'll have the union back again. Hooray, hooray, for the union we must stand. It's the only organization, protect the living men, boys. It makes our women happy, our children clap the hand. The CDP stick and the good folks are steaming in no frying pan. And the president and John L. Lewis have signed a decree to call for Mitch and Rainey to our offer May the tree. Go down in Alabama, organize every believing man. Spread the news all over the land, we got the union back again. Hooray, hooray, for the union we must stand. This is the only organization. Protect the living man, boys, it makes our women happy. Our children clap the hand. The city beef stick and the good folks are steaming in the drying pan. There's one law president rolled with fast and many operators mad. Give all the men the right to organize, join the union of our choice. When the president had passed the law, we all did shout for joy. When they said no operator, shape or ball, shouldn't bother the union boys. Hooray, hooray, for the union we must stand. That the only organization protect the living men, boys. It makes the women happy. Our children clap the hand. The city beef stick and the good folks are steaming in the frying pan. In 1932, we're sometimes sad and blue. Traveling round from place to place Trying to find some work to do If we're successful to find a job The wages were too small We scarce to live in the summertime Almost starving to fall Hooray, hooray For the union we must stand At the old organization Protect the living men Boys, it makes the women happy Our children clap the hand the city beef stick and the good folks job steaming in the old frying pan. Before we got our union back, it's very sad to say. Old blue shakes and overall were the topics of the day. They were so full of patches and so badly torn. Our wives had a soap about an hour before they could be worn. Hooray, hooray, for the union we must stand. It's the old organization protect the living men, boys. It makes our women happy. Our children clap the hand. The city beef stick and the good folk job steaming in the old frying pan. Now when our union men walked out, got the good tools on their back, great machine and the fine silk sack, the brand new miller block hand, fine silk sock and the flow shine shoes, they glitter and against the sun. Got dollars in the pockets, smoking good cigars, boys, this what the union done. Hooray, hooray, for the union we must stand. As the old organization 
protect the living man. Boys, it makes the women happy. Our children clap the hand. The silly beast again, the good folks are skinning in those frying pan. Before we got our union back, our wives was always mad. When they went out to the church, a princess was all they had. But since we got our union back, they're happier all the while. Silk and satin on every kind to meet with every style. Hooray, hooray, for the union we must stand. Let the old organization protect the living man. Boys, it makes the women happy. Our children clap the hand. The city beast stick and the good folk job steaming in those frying pan. Okay, and now we have um, a it's a seven minute clip of a speech that Mario Savio gave uh, in December of 1964 at Sproul Hall in uh, University of California, Berkeley, um, and this is. Uh, this is a pretty famous speech now. It's getting a lot more attention these days. Actually, part of this uh, this notion of um, uh, putting your body upon the gears in the machine, that was quoted in Battlestar Galactica uh, in, during a labor scene. And um, uh, Tim DeChristopher's um, uh, going to prison, you know, uh, speech that he gave after his conviction sort of evoked uh, this... Um, this moment from Mario Savio, and uh, it's interesting. People are talking about it uh, these days, and it's in the consciousness. So I thought you'd be you'd be interested. What's also particularly interesting is he addresses um, uh, what's going on on the campus with some of the union workers. And you know, this uh, if you recall that piece by Kevin Drum, uh, which talked about the the cleave between uh, union and Many of like the student leaders. This guy was uh, Savio was from the Berkeley Free Speech Movement, and um, this this cleave ended up really hurting the the Democratic movement and the progressive uh, the Democratic Party and the the progressive liberal movement uh, because people were split into sort of two camps: social liberalism and economic liberalism. And um, we've talked about that on the show. It's interesting. So he just, in passing, mentions uh, what's going on with the union workers there. But uh, and uh, we've also talked on the show about hopefully how that cleave is closing. But uh, so here is uh, this clip from Mario Savio. Have a great Labor Day, folks. You know, I just want to say one brief thing. About something the previous speaker said. I didn't want to spend too much time on that because I don't think it's important enough. But one thing is worth considering. He's the he's the nominal head of an organization supposedly representative of the undergraduates, whereas in fact, under the current directors, it derives its authority as delegated power from the administration. It's totally unrepresentative of the graduate students and TAs. But he made the following statement, I quote, I would ask all those who are not definitely committed to the FSM cause to stay away from the demonstration. All right, now listen to this. For all upper division students who are interested in alleviating the TA shortage problem, I would encourage you to offer your services to department chairman and advisors. That has two things, a strike breaker and a fink. I'd like to say, I'd like to say one other thing about a union problem. Upstairs, you may have noticed already on the second floor of Sproul Hall, locals 40 and 127 of the Painters Union are painting the inside of the second floor of Sproul Hall. Now, apparently that action had been planned sometime in the past. I've tried to contact those unions, unfortunately, and tears my heart out. They're as bureaucratized as the administration. It's difficult to get through to anyone in authority there. Very sad. We're still, we're still making an attempt. Those people up there have no desire to interfere with what we're doing. I would ask that they be considered and that they not be heckled in any way. And I think that, you know, 
while there's unfortunately no sense of no sense of solidarity at this point between unions and students, there at least need be no, you know, excessively hard feelings between the two groups. Now, there are at least two ways in which sit-ins and civil disobedience and whatever, at least two major ways in which it can occur. One, when a law exists, is promulgated, which is totally unacceptable to people, and they violate it again and again and again till it's rescinded, appealed. All right. But there's another way. There's another way. Sometimes the form of the law is such as to render impossible its effective violation as a method to have it repealed. Sometimes the grievances of people are more, extend more to more than just the law, extend to a whole mode of arbitrary power, a whole mode of arbitrary exercise of arbitrary power. And that's what we have here. We have an autocracy which, run, which runs this university. It's managed. We were told the following. If President Kerr actually tried to get something more liberal out of the regents in his telephone conversations, why didn't he make some public statement to that effect? And the answer we received from a well-meaning liberal was the following. He said, would you ever imagine the manager of a firm making a statement publicly in opposition to his board of directors? That's the answer. Well, I ask you to consider, if this is a firm, and if the board of regents are the board of directors, and if President Kerr, in fact, is the manager, and I tell you something, the faculty are a bunch of employees and we're the raw materials, but we're a bunch of raw materials that don't mean to be, have any process upon us, don't mean to be made into any product, don't mean, don't mean to end up being bought by some clients of the university, be they the government, be they industry, be they organized labor, be they anyone, we're human beings. <laughs> And that, that brings me to the second mode of civil disobedience. There's a time when the operation of the machine becomes so odious, makes you so sick at heart that you can't take part. You can't even passively take part. And you've got to put your bodies upon the gears and upon the wheels, upon the levers, upon all the apparatus, and you've got to make it stop. And you've got to indicate to the people who run it, to the people who own it, that unless you're free, the machine will be prevented from working at all. <laughs> that doesn't mean, and it will be interpreted to mean, unfortunately, by the bigots who run the examiner, for example. That doesn't mean that you have to break anything. One thousand people sitting down someplace, not letting anybody buy, not letting anything happen, can stop any machine, including this machine, and it will stop. We're going to do the following. And the greater the number of people, the safer they'll be, and the more effective it will be. We're going, once again, to march up to the second floor of Sproul Hall. And we're going to conduct our lives for a while in the second floor of Sproul Hall. We'll show movies, for example. We tried to get un chant d'amour. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's tied up in the court because of a lot of squeamish moral mothers for a moral America and other people on the outside. The same people who get all their ideas out of the San Francisco Examiner. Sad, sad. But Mr. Landau, Mr. Landau has gotten to some other films. Likewise, we'll do something. We'll do something which hasn't occurred at this university in a good long time. We're going to have real classes up there. But there are going to be freedom schools conducted up there. We're going to have classes on the First and Fourteenth Amendments. We're going to spend our time learning about the things this university is afraid that we know. We're going to learn about freedom up there, and we're going to learn by doing. Now, 
We've had some good long rallies. Just one moment. We've had some good long rallies. And I think I'm sicker of rallies than anyone else here. This is not going to be long. I'd like to introduce one last person, one last person before we enter Sproul Hall. Yeah. And uh, the person is Joan Baez.